So I, I, uh, I have a lot of content for this class, more than I could cover probably in a year. And we only have seven weeks. Oh, wow. So I'm going to be emailing you out some articles, some links to different videos that will really uh, expand on what we touch on. So uh, I'm going to ask you to put your name, email address, and phone number on me. I don't think I'll need a phone number, but again, if I try to email you, I need those back. You know, a phone number would be great. So if you could complete that and just pass that around, and we'll get that going. I do need two volunteers to pass out a couple of handouts. Amy, okay, and Bill. Okay, so the two, huh? Same, different. So the two, the, the two handouts, one is a list of the core scriptures that we're going to be really leaning on heavily in this class. There are, these are scriptures that you probably haven't heard before for health, wealth, and relationship. By the way, I hope that's a class you intended to come to, because that's where we're going to come. So, um, and then the other is a list of book recommendations. So there is going to be some homework for this class. The first homework is for you to get a book on one of these areas. It can be one of the recommended ones, or it can be some of you, a, a good friend who's really winning in this area, recommended, or it could be um, something you saw on Amazon and just had all kinds of likes and five stars and all that stuff, and you can go with that. Uh, but the idea is that we want to learn and grow and eventually win in all of these three areas. <coughs> So please, uh, please do buy a book this week. Most of these are really easy reads. And uh, if you have a book but you haven't read it, then go ahead and you can read it. You don't have to buy a book. Uh, but if you have a book and you read it, you don't remember anything from it, uh, you may want to go ahead and read, read it again. Thank you. So Bill, you can just put the extras over there on that little pub table there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so uh, aside from our spiritual journey, I believe these are the three most critical areas of our life. Your health, your wealth, and your relationships. And we're going to dig into each one of those. Today is going to be more of an introductory overview class. Um, next week, we're going to talk about wealth building and what wealth means and does not mean. We're going to look at different myths, and we're obviously going to answer any questions that you have. The week after that, we're going to talk about strategies for building wealth, your personal wealth. You're, we're going to actually take like 20 minutes, and you're going to... Just start writing some ideas, some thoughts. We're going to brainstorm. We're going to break up into small groups and share what we're working on. We're going to try and get people like-minded together, you know, people who have similar goals, if possible. And we're going to kind of get that in writing. Okay? The two weeks after that, we're going to do the same thing with health. We're going to talk about health, all the misinformation that's out there. We're going to try and cut through some of that, but again, the key is you keep learning in this yourself because, as you may have noticed, the guidance, the consensus, tends to change over time. And it would be great to get in on the, the good science early than 30 years after the USDA says, oh, okay, I guess eggs are okay. You, know, <laughs> you, you don't want to wait. You, know, you want to find out as soon as possible because you don't want the experiment to be on you. You, know, you want to win in this area. And then, the week after that, we're going to talk about strategies again. And then the, follow, the last two weeks, we're going to look at relationships. And if we have time, that last one, we're going to talk about and hopefully brainstorm synergies on how we can do two things or all three of these together. For example, you want to do better with money, so I'm going to eat out less often. So I'm going to bring my own lunch to work and because I'm not going out to lunch with somebody, I'm going to go ahead and take a walk after I eat with a coworker. And so I'm, I'm getting exercise, I'm saving money, and I'm working on a relationship. You know? 
And so when we can do those things, like, you know, that's how our significant others. We go home, we put music on instead of TV, we eat our dinner, and then we go for a walk after dinner. And so, and then we're talking, and again, it's the same type of thing. And we generally eat healthier when we eat at home. Anyway, we're, there's a lot of stuff we're gonna get into. But the last week, I'm hoping we can touch on those synergies. Uh, one thing I'm also working on is developing a website for this. So where we can kind of stay in touch and post those, those, those strategies. Again, it's anonymous and everything. And where we can also post victories, challenges, things like that. So uh, that's something that's in the works. So again, the homework, the first piece of homework is to please get a book. Uh, your, pray about it. Your heart will probably tell you which area you, know, you need most right away. And then look for a book in there if you want to ask me about that book. Some of them I found very good. Some of them I put on there just so there's an opposing view. And I didn't think the science was very good. But I, do, I don't want to be telling you what you should be reading or not. Again, these are just suggestions. Uh, Going find more. So these are the three areas of critical in life. There's a scripture that talks about Paul. He talks about, I do not aimlessly beat the air, right? And we know that spiritually we're not supposed to be aimless. But for most of my life, I was aimless in my health. Because I'm thin, so I could eat whatever I wanted. Only I was sick all the time. With wealth, I spent everything I earned for the first 35 years of my life. I lived paycheck to paycheck. And even though I made good money, I spent all of it and then some. Not very wise. And the third area, relationships, you know. Uh, just suffered so much pain from not knowing, learning, and understanding how a healthy, strong relationship should look like and how to, to get there. And so, um, I'll tell you a little bit of, of my journey here. Is um, 2003, I was on vacation. It was in a beach town, and I hate the sun and the sand. <laughs> I'm one of those guys, give me mountains, give me lakes, give me snow, <laughs> you know. So this is perfect weather for me. And um, so I, I bought a book. I went to a bookstore, and I got a book. And I picked up a book on money. It was uh, The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. And that book really resonated with me. And really, I'll tell you the hook that got me. He asked a question. He says, think about this. How much money have you earned in the last 10 years? And, and you really, I mean, you, you go, okay, well, if I made $50,000 a year, that's 500 grand. You know, that's half a million dollars. You know, when you, when you kind of put that number together, you, and then he says, what do you have to show for it? And I had nothing except some credit card debt and a car loan. Okay. I was like, this is insane. And he makes the point very well, I think, that if you don't change your behavior, you're going to be in the exact same spot in 10 more years <coughs> or 20 years. And I would add, with our relationships, with our health, with our wealth, it's a, think about what, what you've come up with in 10 years, or the last 10 years, and what you would like to come up with in the next 10 years. You want that growth, you know? You want that, that peace and that joy from having that. So, um, continuing on with my little journey here, about five years ago, I read a book, uh, my wife got it free in something that we went to, some dinner, and it talked about, uh, I don't remember the title, but it was basically, it was a study of people populations where there are more centenarians than anywhere else in the world. Centenarians, people who live in, in their hundreds. And it looked for those commonalities in those people. What do they have in common? What do their lives look like? And the interesting thing is the author, when researching the book, he got so much pushback from different physicians saying, I don't want to live to be 100. Why would I? I don't want to talk about this stuff. Because in their mind, <coughs> old age translated into you're in pain, you, you can't get around, you're shut in, you're lonely, your friends have died. And so they had this idea in their head that I don't want that. But he was studying people who were in their 90s, and, well actually in their 100s, 
But people who were mobile, people who walked around, people gardened, you know, people who walked their dog, you know, people who were active, people who had good health. They weren't in a lot of pain. And people who had friends, people who, even though some friends may have died, they made new friends. And so that's what he's studying, and that's what his book is largely about. But it's, it's such a flip in perspective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us, myself included, a few years ago, had that mentality, I don't want to live to be that old. You know, that doesn't sound fun at all, unless, you know, they really get some medical advances coming soon, you know, other than that, you know, that's not where I want to be. But now I think of it as, wait, certain things that you do can lead to certain outcomes. So um, I started really kind of studying this out. I started thinking about what these people's lifestyles had looked like to get them to that point. And what I realized is that their lifestyles, which were composed of their habits, led to those results, those outcomes. And so if you can change your choices, change your habits, change the start, then you can change the end. So I actually was going to write a book. It was a brilliant book in my mind. <laughs> and it was on how, because I understand wealth building, a good friend of mine here, financial advisor. I understand compound interest. I understand how when you're doing certain things, you're investing and saving, it's earning money for you, that that compound interest is really working on your behalf. But if you live paycheck to paycheck, if you have debt, compound interest is working against you. And so I picked that up, but when I read this other book, it clicked. My habits compound as well. My health habits compound. If I have ice cream every night, that's gotta compound. If I eat my veggie snacks for lunch, that's gonna compound as well. If I go for a walk after lunch, or after dinner, that's going to compound. And so that's what the book I was going to write. And then I found out somebody had already gotten, gotten her first <laughs> and did a much better job. <laughs> so one of the videos I'm going to send you tonight or tomorrow is from Darren Hardy. And it's called The Compound Effect. I don't remember the name of the video, but The Compound Effect. And he writes about how all of these areas of our lives compound at work, at home, all these things. And so, um, to me that was very powerful. That book, I meant to put, I don't think I put it on that list, did I? It's going on the next batch. <laughs> this is my, my little edit sheet. I had Men from Mars, Women from Venus on there twice. Uh, if you see any other errors, just let me know. So obviously this class is not about how perfect I am or my, my personal brilliance. You know, I have been very slow to recognize some of these things. But the good news is I've started recognizing them. And my life is much better in the last few years since I've actually been very passionate about learning this stuff. You know, I recommend, so you, you have this list of book recommendations. I recommend that all of us read at least four books a year, aside from the Bible, which I recommend you read every day. So, one book a year for your spiritual journey. One book a year for learning about your health, well-being, nutrition, fitness, any of those things. Losing weight, building muscle, any of those things. One book a year for your personal wealth building. And one book a year for strengthening your relationships, for making them healthier. That's one per quarter. That's one book for every three months. It's very doable. In fact, I would add, I would suggest that you put all the odds in your favor that you're going to do this and put that on your calendar in January. This year, you can still read four books this year, but you only have half a year, so it's more challenging. But you can still do it. But with 12 full months, you certainly should be able to do this. Now imagine what that looks like. In five years, you've read five books on health, five books on wealth building, five books on relationships. And you're not just reading to, okay, I did it. You're reading and saying, how does this apply to me? How, how can I implement this in my life? 
What does my life look like if I do this? What does my marriage look like? What am I, and you start making changes. Oh yeah, I forgot to do a will. I, I said I was gonna do that last year, I never did that. Or I said I was gonna get life insurance or disability or long-term care or whatever, and I never did that. Or I need to increase my, my uh, 401k contribution because I'm, I'm still at this percent. I wanted to do that, increase it every year because I couldn't do all at once what I wanted to do. You know, so as you, you know, pay off debts or as you build an emergency fund, you say, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do this now or, you know. And so those books keep you focused on that. And as you're doing these things, as you're making these changes, over five years, you're gonna be so much smarter and wiser in all of these areas. And your life is gonna start looking different. And 10 years, you're gonna have people coming up to you and say, hey, let me buy you a lunch and pick your brain because you, you got this and I need this. People are gonna be coming to you because you're gonna be winning in this. It's going to be obvious. So um, that would be my recommendation is put on your outlook, put in your day plan or whatever, your New Year's resolutions. I'm going to read these four books. Pick out the books in January and get them. And so you've got them in a the stack right there and every quarter you go get them. Just make it easy on yourself. One thing is, so I said this class is not about my personal brilliance. I have been a failure in these areas so many times and for most of my life. So it's not about my my impeccable record, or my, my personal brilliance. This is not a prosperity message. This is not, you know, the Lord longs to bless you. If you give, then you will receive. And if you don't have faith, then you, you know. No, it's not that stuff. This is more like boundaries. Anybody read that book, Boundaries? You do your part. You don't try to do God's part. You let God do his part. But you do your part. and don't expect God to do your part. And your part is hard work. Getting out of debt is hard work. Saying no to yourself with money, food, whatever, in the morning when you're warm and comfortable in your bed and say, no, I need to get up and do something. I need to go exit. That's hard. But to me, it is all about love to you. One of the core scriptures on here, teacher, this is Matthew 22, 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That implies you know how to love yourself. I did not know how to love myself. I was horrible at it. I didn't have a very good example of it. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I, have, I had a brother who's an alcoholic. Whenever Tom got any money at all, $5 for washing someone's dog or something, he bought beer. And that beer was gone right away. He could not say no to himself. If I, once I learned some compassion for my brother, I understood pretty quickly that it was not an act of love for me to give him money. Love for me to him was food or clothing. Love is not always just saying yes. Love is sometimes saying no and doing something else. You know, God says no to us all the time, right? Because he's smarter <laughs> than we are. He knows that what you're asking for is going to hurt you. He knows that you're not ready for it. I heard someone say once that God doesn't say no. He says, not yet, or beloved, I have something better planned for you. I really think that's, that, that shows God's heart for us. We need to have the same heart for others, but also for ourselves. We need to learn to say no to ourselves so we can say yes to the things that are most important. So another example, I want to go to Italy. It's not going to be cheap. That means I have to say no to myself a lot so I can say yes to myself for something I dream about. I dream of going to the Amalfi Coast. Has anyone ever heard of that place? Yes. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Have you been? Oh, I've never been. Oh, good. <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful places. I was in Italy, but I was in the military, so I didn't see the most beautiful places. 
Well, I dream of going there. That means I don't go to Walmart or Sam's Club every weekend. Because I know I can't say no to it. It's only three dollars. <laughs> and that adds up. Right? And so I have to change my behavior. I like what Dave Ramsey, when he talks about you know, getting out of debt and saving investing, he says it's not about math. It's about human behavior. You know, and that's why so many marriages improve when they get that piece addressed, when they're talking about them. So this is not a prosperity message. Anyone have any confusion <laughs> about that? So, um, Bill, you were my roommate. Do you remember what my favorite scripture is? Favorite scripture? Let's see. It had something to do with God. <laughs> <laughs> He actually is a rocket scientist. Yeah. <laughs> or he was, yeah. So uh, my favorite scripture is John 10.10. 10. This is also on the list. The thief comes only to, kill, to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now you think of what, you know, in America, the thief, the prince of the air, we live in enemy-occupied territory. What, what is steal, kill, and destroy look like when it comes to our health in America these days? Mm. What does Obese. it look like? Huh? Obese. And inflammation, heart disease, cancer. Alzheimer's, cancer, all these things, they're starting to decode it, and they're starting to say, well, diet and lifestyle actually probably have a lot to do with it. It's not just some random thing. But they don't have it all figured out, which is why we need to keep reading and learning and growing. What, is, what does it look like Still kill and destroy when it comes to our personal wealth, our money. Debt, debt, credit, debt credit card debt, spending everything you earn. Bankruptcy. Debt collectors calling, bankruptcy, foreclosure, repossession, stress, pay money fights, divorce, wrecked families. What does it look like for a relationship? Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. Divorce, infidelity, all kinds of stuff. But Jesus says, I came to give you life, life to the full. What does that look like? What does that look like? And you can shout out or you can just think about that. That might be something to, to journal about tonight. What does my life look like, life to the full? And again, this is a prosperity message. Because life to the full means that there's going to be lots of laughs, but also lots of tears. When someone you love passes away, I don't care how full your life is that. That hurts. You know, there's a, a heart full of loss, you know. Life to the full with our health, with our wealth, with our relationships. I believe it's possible. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things God works for the good of those who love him. But we also know that God is not a wish-granting genie who says, oh, this is what you want, my child? Okay. You know, he's not our, our friendly, lovable grandpa. He wants what's for our ultimate good, our best good. His number one priority for all of us, I believe, I don't want to speak for him, but I believe is to get us to heaven, to help us to make it through enemy-occupied territory. Which means he always, that scripture could just as well say, God works in everything for the ultimate or the best good of those who love him. We need to do the same for ourselves. Better good for me, like if I want to go to Italy, the better good is me going to Italy and not me going to Sam's Club, right? That's the better good. The better good for my health is me saying, you know, I'm not going to do dessert but once every couple weeks. And, and candy, that's for kids. I don't need candy every day. I mean, that's kind of a bad habit, you know? And all these different ways I can say no to those little things so I can say yes to the bigger things, the, the better things, the ultimate things. Especially like relationships. So um, uh, let me see. I, I'm kind of skipping around. I've got 18 pages here. So my challenge is to not spend all the time on one point, <laughs> but also not to miss anything I think is really significant. So... Um, Let's see, God does give us guiding principles in his word, and oftentimes very explicit instructions for avoiding poor health and poverty and broken relationships. 
If you've ever read the Proverbs, you've picked up on some of those. Flee from the, the hunter, flee from the snare, like the gazelle. Flee from debt, like the gazelle from the hunter. So many. So our part, part of that hard effort, that hard work that we're going to do, is studying those principles. And some of that's going to be the scriptures that we have here. Some of it's going to be the scriptures that we share in class over the next six, seven weeks, the next six weeks. And then um, and just when you read your Bible, you know, highlight those things. These, these are things that are, are tools. These are weapons we can use. You know, when we start strategizing, how can I develop these new habits so I can make new, better choices consistently? Those scriptures are powerful for helping us. What I like to do is I like to turn, turn, turn my, my points there into a prayer, which I look at in the morning, which I look at at night, and it helps me because I'm inviting God into this struggle. Now, I don't know that God wants everyone to be wealthy. I don't know that God wants everyone to be healthy. I mean, stuff happens. My mother was a single mom. She earned basically minimum wage for most of her life. She was never rich. But she is one of the most wealthiest women I've ever known. Because she has, such, she has more than enough for her needs, but her needs are so much less than most people's. And she's content. And she's full of joy and gratitude. So she doesn't have a lot, but she has more than enough. I think way too many of us have too much stuff and not enough peace. Dave Ramsey calls that stuffitis. I think it's a good term. We're addicted to stuff. You know? I heard one person, they were talking about health. He says, we overconsume, we overeat, but we're all malnourished. How is that possible? Because we're not eating real food. <laughs> you know? But again, we'll get into all that stuff. Okay, so um, I already described what the class is going to look like. We're going to do two weeks on wealth building, two weeks on health, and two weeks, or maybe one and a half, on relationships. And then hopefully we can talk about some of those synergies, too. And as you think of any synergies, I threw out a couple earlier, write them down. Bring them ready to share. You know, these, these are things that I don't have all the right answers. I don't have all the good ideas. And I, I definitely am here to learn from you as well. So uh, la, 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 la. Sorry about all the la-las. I'd already covered that there. Okay, so um, one of the things I do when I read, and I'm not telling you how to read, but a lot of us when we read, my wife is a very fast reader, but I tend to retain more than she does. And so it's one of those things, because when I read, I underline, I circle, I write notes. Things that, this is what I started doing in my Bibles, and then I started doing that when I read other books. Because I'm reading to study it. I'm not just reading to read. I want to learn this. Right. And so I'm owning this process. And actually, my, my hope, my prayer is that you will all love learning. You know, see that as kind of this curiosity about God's creation. You know, because God put these invisible principles and these guiding principles out there for us. And as we learn them, it helps us so much. Um, I mentioned my, my approach is to read those four books. Uh, and just imagine what that looks like over five years or ten years. Uh, is that sign-up sheet going around? I haven't even noticed. It's here. Okay, we need to, because I want to get everyone's email address so I can make sure I send you some of the stuff after this. So, in this class, you're going to hear some things that you're going to go, uh, duh, everyone knows that. But trust me, everyone doesn't. You're going to read some things that you go, yeah, that, that actually makes sense. I'm going to use that. You're going to, read, you're going to hear some things or read some things that you're going to go, yeah, that's garbage. You know? <laughs> what I want you to do is just think about it, though. You own this. You own your bodies. You own your relationships. You own your personal wealth. So really think about it. And you filter it. Just like when you watch the news. You know everything's biased. So you've got to filter it. Which is why I don't watch much of the news, because it just brings me down, man. So, but with this, you really want to process it, and you want to filter it, and you want to own it, you know? Because you're going to make choices based on this. 
This is that you say, oh, well, Rob says I'm going to do it. I'll tell you, I have learned more about wealth building in the last five years than I learned 20 years in the military. I had mutual funds. I had them invested. But I didn't know anything about it. And, and I trusted people to just make the right decision for me. I didn't know these people. So do you think they made the right decisions for me? They made the right decisions for them. Right. I have more in my retirement fund, in my 401k, in five years than I have in my IRA from 25 years. Which is, it shows you how abysmal my returns were. So we own this. You know, other people can give us bad advice. It's our job to process it and to decide what we're going to take and what we're not. I did not choose wisely. You know, like Indiana Jones, I chose poorly. You know, <laughs> luckily I didn't die, you know, with you know, poison, but, you know, I'm hoping to choose more wisely going forward. And I mm -hmm. hope we can, all of us, get that going. So I read books. That is my thing. When, my, when I'm in my sanctuary, when I'm in my solitude, I'm reading books. I love books. I read probably a book a month or more. I read books over and over again. They're, they're, they're friends, you know? I don't, I don't bend the book over like that. That's disrespectful to my friend. I use a bookmark, you know? So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a book geek, okay? I readily admit that. I'm not trying to push books on you, if that's not your thing. I do want you to, to read, but there's many ways of learning. But I think reading is great because you can, it, it, slows your, it slows you down. So I listen to audiobooks in my car, and if it's something like Malcolm McDowell, I don't retain it nearly as well as when I read the book itself. Because I'm slowing down, I'm actually thinking about it more. Whereas when I'm driving, I sometimes have to reverse it. I miss the entire thing. What was that, you know? Uh, or I just, I didn't really think too much about it. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, I didn't really process it. You know, so books help you with that. I have a good friend. He's the chief of investor relations for my company. He's doing very well. And he knows investing very well. His 401k and his pension and all kinds of other stuff is well over $2 million. You know, he's a good friend. He doesn't read books. I was like, Dave, do you have any books? No, I don't read books. I read Money Magazine. I order it, and then when I fly, I read two or three of them at a time, and I might get one or two nuggets out of the entire magazine, or entire, all three of them. I go the rest away. You know, because he's been reading and studying this stuff for 30 years, or probably longer, because he's 55 now, you know? He doesn't learn much anymore from those things, but he still gets a nugget or two, and he's humble enough to admit to himself that there's still stuff he can learn. And so he goes looking for it. He just doesn't have the time or patience or enjoyability to read a book, you know? So there are YouTube videos by most of these authors. So like I said, I'm gonna send you some of their links. Um, I, I don't suggest that though as an alternative to reading, but more as a compliment to help kind of reinforce what you're picking up when you're reading the books. And then you read the book by David, or you watch the video by David Bach who wrote the Automatic Millionaire or Smart Women Finish Rich. And you, it starts kind of going, oh, okay, that's making sense. Because you know, we learn by many different ways. We learn by watching, we learn by reading, we learn by hearing, all these different ways. And so the more ways you can put into your life to learn, the better. So figure out what works best for you. I like books. I'm a book geek. So, um, so I, I've already talked about how when you make different choices, you get different outcomes. And I think the clearest example of that is in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I don't think that's on my core scriptures. I can probably put it there, though. And that scripture tells us, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses, now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. That's God. He's pleading with us to make better choices spiritually. But that certainly shows that we can make different choices and get different outcomes. You know, there's that, the defi that definition of insanity, right? You've heard that. If you keep doing the same thing but expect different results... That's, that's crazy. And, uh, and we've all done it, I think. 
So let me see. That was Deuteronomy 30, 19. 30, 19. Oh, it was 19. Okay. <laughs> you told me. Just remember, life is choices. <laughs> life and death. I, I give you a choice. I am just scrolling through 18 pages of notes here to get to something I haven't already mentioned. Have you all ever heard of the book, The Blue Zones? The Blue Zones is on that list, I think. And that's another book that studies these populations of centenarians and what their lifestyles look like. Now, the book I read was written by Seventh-day Adventists. So, you know, they don't advocate eating meat because, you know, that wasn't made available until after the garden. And so in its original state, we didn't eat meat. And so that's what they do. Um, but the Okinawans eat meat and eat fish. So, and that's another one of those populations. So I don't think that's it, but think about it. You consider it. You know, what works best for you? Try different things. I, I'm not a medical expert, but I am, I do run, my company's well-being, a wellness program. And so I, I get paid to read this stuff every day and to talk to people about it every day. So I'm learning and I'm kind of teaching a little bit as well. I'm designing a program to help people develop those healthy habits. One, two of our challenges, one is to eliminate wheat or gluten, grains, from your diet for 30 days, wheat elimination. And the idea is some of these foods, the other is to do it for, with dairy. And the idea behind this is some people have a sensitivity. They have some kind of reaction to these things that most people can eat, but they don't know what's causing that reaction. And so I, I work with one woman, she did that and her migraines virtually disappeared. She's in her 50s. She is so glad not to have these migraines anymore. I talked to someone, his rash went away. Uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I stopped, I reduced significantly my sugar and grains. I also started doing probiotics, sauerkraut, which is fermented vegetables, so it's got probiotics. My sinus infections went away. I've had three surgeries for my sinus. I've had three or four sinus infections a year for 20 years, well, 20 plus years, since 92, I think. That was the first surgery. And they just went away in the last year and a half. I don't know why. I don't know if it's the wheat or the sugar or the sauerkraut working for me, <laughs> but I'm gonna keep doing the same thing because I hate sinus infections. They make me miserable and they hurt. And then I'm mean to people, you know. So it's just not a good thing spiritually at all. So, but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't tried that. You know, so that's another thing we'll talk about in a few weeks though is, you know, try different things. Listen to your body. Does something feel better or worse when you do something? I don't think we're cookie cutters. I, I have read studies where they have people eat the same food and do the same exercises, basically trying to make their lifestyles identical. And some people gained weight and some people lost weight. And I think we're starting to break the code on that. I think it has to do with the gut, the microbiome. Mm -hmm. But it's way more than just calories in, calories out. Right. You know, calories in, calories out says, you are thin because you burn more calories than you consume or you're not then because you consume more calories than you burn. It's very judgmental. It, it, it has judgment with it. You, you're lazy. You eat too much. You're industrious. You know how to say no, you have willpower. It, 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 it's giving all kinds of adjectives and adverbs here. And the truth is, our bodies are way more complex than that. There's a lot going on, and we're gonna dig into that and again, you're going to disagree with some things I say, some things are going to make sense, and some things you're just going to go, well, that's a good nugget, but yeah. But and again, that's fine. I just hope you get something out of this. So 
So I was going to show you a little video on compound interest right now, but I think I'll have to uh, send that to you. They told me internet connection is, is kind of shaky, and so I was advised to download the video, but I didn't know how to do that. So I'm going to probably send you a link on compound interest. Just a four-minute video, the basics of it. Did anyone catch the article this week, last weekend on compound interest, USA Today? 66% of Americans don't understand this financial concept. It was compound interest. Two-thirds of Americans. Two-thirds of Americans also live paycheck to paycheck. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> the scriptures tell us that the fool devours all he earns, or all he has. You know, God says it's not wise <laughs> to live paycheck to paycheck like I did for most of my life. Now I'll tell you, I didn't know that. My examples in life were my parents and they both lived paycheck to paycheck. My mother was a single mom with 11 kids. She got $200 a month in child support. She made minimum wage. She spent everything. I don't think God was judging her. I don't think God was like, you fool. Marilyn? You know? My dad made $40,000 a year, paid $200 a month in child support. And he spent everything he earned and more. That was not wise. I was doing well and spending everything. I was the fool because of what I was doing. But I've changed that. Amen. Different choices. So uh, let's see. So the compounding effect. I told you I was kind of inspired to write a book about how everything in our lives compound. And I was after reading that book, it kind of clicked. You know, I, was, I understood compound interest. Thank you, Dave Ramsey. And then I understood that that applied to everything else because I read that other book on these 100-year-olds. I also had something going on in my personal life which brought it home very, home, very close to home for me. My dad was retired. My dad's health was horrible. He had smoked for 40 years, so his lungs were in bad shape. He had also had pneumonia like 10 times. So his lungs were weak. He was hurting when he came here in 2011 for my wedding. He had the hardest time. I'm amazed in retrospect that he was able to do that. But he told me when I left, I can't come back. You know, this is heartbreaking. My dad couldn't walk more than like a block, usually less, because of his lungs. I remember my whole childhood, because I ran track and cross country, and when I, even my, I was in the military, so I had to go running on weekends and it looked stupid. But you know, <laughs> I, no, I just loved running on the lakes in Minnesota. My dad would scoff at bicyclists and joggers and, ah, you know, it's silly. They look, look at those short shorts, they're silly, you know. <laughs> and, you know, he never saw the value in exercise or good health or healthy habits or anything like that. My dad, I mentioned he spent everything he earned. My dad was a, a, a mailman. He, he was a letter carrier. He, and he also carried his brown bag lunch until they got divorced when, when I was two. Not long after that, he, he thought to himself, I deserve to buy my own lunch. And then that became breakfast. I mean, too much of a hurry, I'll just pick up breakfast in the canteen or the, because then he got an office job at the post office in Minneapolis. And there was a cafeteria on ground floor, and they served goat meal or bacon eggs or whatever. So I'll just pick that up on the way. It's much more convenient. And then he started doing dinner for 20 years at least. He ate almost every meal in a restaurant. He bought a house in 1970. It was a duplex. He had rental income coming in. That could have been paid off in 15 years or a 15 year mortgage. But my dad got a 30, and he refinanced as the value went up and bought new cars with the money. He did that every few years. So when my dad died, or I'm sorry, when he retired, his health was horrible. He had no money, most of his pension, and he didn't get Social Security because the post office exempted, was exempt from Social Security. So my dad, most of his pension went to his mortgage on a house he'd owned for 40 years. Mm. Extremely sad. Now, I'm not judging my father. 
I'm trying to learn from what he experienced. I want, and I believe he would want a different outcome for me, you know. My dad also was too busy for relationships for most of his adult life. Children weren't interesting until they were 18 or something, mm -hmm. you know. So basically, ah, yeah, shut up, yeah, I'm trying to talk over here, you know. So my dad, he also wasn't around much when we were children and bad things happened. So my dad, he didn't have very good relationships with his children, neighbors, anything like that. So when my dad retired, he was, he was that guy. He was in pain, he was shut in, he was lonely. He watched a lot of Fox News and a lot of NCIS and In the Heat of the Night, Bonanza and Raha. He, uh, it, could, it could have been so much better for him, you know? And so I had all that I'm, I'm seeing firsthand with my dad. As I'm reading these books, and I'm start, things are starting to click for me. You know, so that's, that's part of my, my journey, you know? Thankfully, God is good, and God reconciled my dad to his children before he died. And, you know, so, you know, it could have been worse, you know. Um, I think there's a lot more peace in my family now for that. So, um, so all these areas are interconnected. We talked about how the synergies can overplay and can really build on each other for you. But imagine some people, and you may know people like this, who have a lot of wealth but they have very, very poor health. It's, it's not a great life then, right? Uh, I think it was the Dalai Lama who, someone asked him, what puzzles you most about life? He said, man, you know, he, he, he sacrifices his health to accumulate wealth, and then he spends his wealth to try and recuperate his health. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. It's a very good quote. I'll, I'll try and put that somewhere. He goes on to talk about how he worries about the future and he regrets the past. He doesn't live in the present. So he lives his life never having really lived. You know? If you have great health but no wealth, life is hard. You've got stress. You've got worries. You see someone in need that you want to help and you can't pay you know, their electric bill. You can't do those things. Not that that's the only way to help people or to give, but it's a great way. And if you have great wealth and you're in really good health, you have lousy relationships, what's it, what's it all about? Where's the fun in that? Where's your joy? Who are you going to share that with? And as we all know, if you have all of these things, but you don't have God, you're missing the biggest piece. In the end, it's, it's a big hole in your heart. So um, our first challenge for all of this is to understand your why. Why do you want to do things different? The why is the most important thing here, guys. Because if your why is too little, it's not going to get you out of bed when it's dark and cold or rainy. It's not going to, it's not going to get you off the couch when you're tired and you just want to sit down for one more show. It's not going to get you to sit down and say, Honey, I'm sorry. That was really mean of me to say that. I was wrong. I hurt you and I feel horrible. Those things we don't want to do. But they're very important if we're going to have those great relationships or really good health, if we're going to have that wealth. We have to learn to do those things. So the why has to be really big. And this is something, this is, this is homework. This is something you have to figure out. The sooner you figure this out, the better. Now, I personally think all of us are going to, it's all going to involve one overarching theme, which is, this is how I love myself. This is how I love myself. Because 
I know for me to have, to be happy, I need to, I want a great relationship with my wife, which means I need to change some things and we need to be on the same page and we need to have those conversations and things like that. So that means we have to do the things different. And for me to have peace with my money, I mean, I have to be worried about this stuff. For me to have a cushion against a car breaking down, against someone hitting me and my axle bending, and now I have to get a new car, but that means I have to come up with another five grand because insurance company only gave me two grand, you know, things like that. For me to have that peace means I need to do different things now. So I have to have a big why for these things. And I think it all comes down to, I am doing this to love myself. I'm, I'm told to love others like myself, to love my neighbor as myself. I need to love myself. Going back to, I say no to something so I can say yes to those big things. I say no to Sam's Club so I can say yes to Italy. I say no to pride so I can have a wonderful marriage or a strong relationship. By the way, I'm going to email you all these 18 pages. <laughs> that's your punishment. No, uh, no, that's just in case I missed anything. You know, and also, you can read this yourself. You can process it yourself. It'll help you understand me a little better, I hope, but also help you think through your wine things. Because you know, I see people writing. Some people didn't bring anything. I normally don't bring anything. And so this is something that you can kind of look through, print it off if you want, mark it up whatever you want to do. Um, with your why, once you know your why, some people it's, I want to see my, my grandkids. You know, for me, I don't have kids yet. We're trying and we are praying. We're doing our part, <laughs> <laughs> which includes IVF, which includes adoption and saving and budgeting for that too, which is not inexpensive. We're doing our part, and we're counting on God to do his part, Amen. you know? Uh, but I want to, I'm, I'm almost 50. I want to see my kids grow up, you know? So I want to do some, now there's no guarantee some bad driver could end that tonight, but, you know, what's it within my realm of control through my choices, I'm going to do what I can toward that end, you know? So how do you keep your why front and center so you don't forget it when you're tired or when you're shopping or tired or you know angry or whatever how do you keep the why front and center any ideas memorize it memorize it if you have create a why and memorize it create and memorize it absolutely um, yes. I want, to, I want to do 10,000 steps a day. How do I get there? Well, I have a little device here that reminds me. It tells me what I've done, and it challenges me. It pushes me, and it, it rewards me with a little <laughs> vibration in rainbow colors. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I feel good when I hit that goal, because I want to get good. I'm nowhere near Jeff yet, because he's like 18,000 steps a day. But I'm getting there, you know? When you have people in your life who push you as well, it helps too. I love the idea of posting it, because that helps me remember. I, I, I put that in there, I put it as a prayer. I put a scripture in there or two. I put it on my mirror in the bathroom. You put it, you do whatever you want. This is what I do, I put it on my mirror. I'm brushing my teeth in the morning, I'm brushing my teeth at night, and I'm reading this. I'm thinking, I also have a picture of the Mulfi Coast up there too. <laughs> Keep me focused. You know, because we live in an ADD world. We have a fire hose, we have a fire hose of information, much of it conflicting, that is hitting us constantly. Every moment you're awake, you're bombarded with so much information. It's hard to stay focused. I mean, it's hard to even stay focused at work because, ooh, email come up, ooh, email. You know, what was that, you know? 
make sure I don't miss something from the ball. You know, and so I, it takes so long to get back into that project. And then just as I'm getting into it, something else comes up. That's what we live in ADD, you know? And so we need to use every trick, every tool we can to help us to stay focused on the big things, the most important things, the things that really say, I love you to ourselves. Uh, la, 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 la. So if you haven't gathered by now, much of this class is going to talk about being intentional. You know, we want, so we're going to gather information, we're going to learn some things, but then we're going to intentionally apply it. We're going to intentionally choose new habits. And anybody know how long it takes to develop a habit? 12 weeks. I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of, okay, I heard 12 weeks? I heard two weeks. Seven days. Seven days. 28. 28 days. So, so the answer I've read <laughs> is most experts who study this stuff say it's three to four weeks. But keep in mind, that's a baby habit. Babies are weak. You can take Katie from them. They're weak. Right? So a baby habit, you can still break really easily. So, but habits get really strong over time. Over years, over decades, they're hard as iron, hard as steel. Let me ask you, who here put on a seatbelt today? Sorry? A seatbelt. Good. Okay, how long did you think, stop and think, oh, I need to put my seatbelt on? No. Not at all! It's automatic! I feel weird. If I back my car on the driveway onto the street, I don't have my seatbelt on. I move 30 feet and I feel weird. That's how strong habits are. By the way, we have mental habits too. We have habits of our eyes, all kinds of things. And we want to replace those that aren't good for us or those that are just aimless with something that is good for us, right? When a negative thought comes in, and Rob, you're so stupid, I can't believe you did that. I am wonderfully made. I am made in God's image. I'm going to replace that thought with something God tells me is the truth, right? I can do that with a lot of things in my life. I can be intentional about that. A habit gets traction over time with repetition. A habit becomes easier when you build routines to make it easier for you to do over and over again. Food prep Sunday, if you want to get healthy, food prep Sunday is something that you incorporate into your life. Or Saturday, whatever, you know? But that's a day where you take your vegetables and you cut off so you got healthy snacks all week. And that's where you, you make a big meal, like stew or chili or something like that. I'm making pork chops tomorrow night, four of them. It'll last me, I'll have lunch one day, I'll have dinner another day, you know? These are things that we can do to reduce the temptation later. You know, we can do these things. So it's a lot easier to say no. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop these strategies, these plans. We're going to be patient with our plans, though. It takes time for your new budget to click. You're going to forget things. You're going to disagree about some things. It's going to take a little time, three months, four months before, OK, this is, this is not smooth enough. Same thing with our diet. Same thing with our exercise. We're going to be very patient with these things. If I'm overweight, it took me years to get overweight. I gotta give myself some time to get to lose that weight. Right. You know, I can't be beating myself up and giving up on this. Well, that don't work either. Like, you gave it three days. Come on, you know. <laughs> give it time. You know, we spend our time to getting the information, gathering the information, and then making good decisions, and then setting it up so it becomes automatic. You know. If I decide that it is wise for me to give 15% of my salary to my 401k for retirement, if I, if I gather that information, I really make a good decision, I go, or I make a, a deliberate, sound decision that I've really thought about, I'm going to do that. I don't want to have to make that decision every pay period. I want to set it up so it becomes ongoing. I don't have to rehash that decision. It's the same thing with my health. 
with relationship to all the, I want to set in place these mechanisms, these routines that build those habits. So we're gonna be patient with the process. We're gonna work, develop the plan, we're gonna spend the time and the energy developing the plan, and then we're gonna work the plan, we're gonna trust the plan. We're gonna pray about it as we develop this stuff, right? We're gonna put scriptures in there. It's gonna be based on God's principles. So, I, I gave an example of 401k, my retirement plan at work. How do I set that up? I make it automatic. And so, I go in, I talk to, I, I set up in Fidelity's site, it flows to our payroll system, and every paycheck they take out, what I told them to take out. And it gets invested in what I told them to invest in. It's automatic. My mortgage payments are automatic. I, you, want, you don't want to have to think about this stuff. The IRS is, is pretty crafty. You may not have noticed this. <laughs> they figured out long ago that if we had to write them a check on April 15th, they would be tax reformed. They realized right away there's no way people are going to write us a check for thousands of dollars. So we're going to take it out a little bit at a time. <laughs> they won't even miss it. You know what? They're going to thank us for giving them some of it back. <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're crafty, but we can learn from that. We can learn with our pay, with our budget, with our savings. We're going to do the same. We're going to take it out before anything else, and then we don't miss it. We're going to figure out how to spend the rest of it. But we're not going to miss that. And we're going we're gonna to love ourselves first. People say, pay yourself first. We're going to love ourselves first with that. The hard part is there's not something easily comparable for your relationships where you can make it automatic. Or your health. You know, I'm going to make it automatic I get an exercise. Well, you can sign up for a gym, but you know, they make a lot of money on those unused gym memberships. Yes, you know? And they still make you pay for them. Even you, don't call, you know? And uh, the, 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 the thing that you can find on Craigslist that is the cheapest is a used, once or twice, used gently treadmill or elliptical or whatever. Exercise equipment, everyone, they sell the image of you being buff, of you being lean, of you being bikini ready, you know? They sell the image of that and then in January, everybody goes out and buys them. In April, it's, a storage container, you know? <laughs> it's got boxes in it, it's got clothes and tiles hanging on it. And, and then it ends up, you know, on the driveway for a yard sale, or we took it to the Goodwill, or whatever. Or it goes in a storage unit and we pay more, <laughs> you know? So, the, the only way I know, and we kind of touched on it already, to make these things automatic is through habits. You know, it's not easy. And it's not, it's not as easy as setting up a direct deposit, a payroll deduction, but it is effective. But what we need to do is we want, to, we want to make it as automatic as possible. Because, again, you don't want to fight these same battles, think these, make these same decisions over and over and over again. Okay. So aren't you glad I'm going to email you all this stuff? Yes. <laughs> okay, so do, 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 do. I talked about how weak habits are at the beginning. Like a baby. Okay, and... Uh, Okay, so, Proverbs 1, 20 through 21. Can someone read that, please? Proverbs 1, 20 through 21. I didn't bring my Bible. I have it written down here. Yeah. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. What does that mean? Wisdom is available. Right What's that? Wisdom is available. Wisdom is everywhere. From every experience that you experience or witness, wisdom can be gleaned. We can gather it to us. Most of us, we don't. We're so busy. We're so ADD because of this world. We don't pick up on these things. I, and 
again, part of this class is learning and understanding. So which understanding is, is the fun, I mean, it's basically what we're talking about when we say wisdom, right? You understand something. Who could read for me, and this is on the core scriptures, Proverbs 24, 30 through 34, nice and loud. Scott. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. It's a very powerful scripture. And I believe this scripture gives us a clue about wisdom. I highlight, I emboldened it. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. If we did that in our lives a lot more often, we'd, be, we'd avoid a lot of stuff. You know, we wouldn't have all that stuff on our shoes that we stubbed. We wouldn't have so much stuff, that, so many scars in our lives. I mean, all the times I watch Americans funny some videos and then went out and said the same stupid things that those people, <laughs> that I laughed at, you know? Or if you've ever seen the science of stupid, you know, I've done those things. I am scientifically stupid, it's true. Um, but that, that, to me, that is the essence right there. If we would just stop and think about it. We can be problem solvers at work, but when it comes to our lives, our relationships, our health, we don't think about it. Like I mentioned, that one woman I work with, Roseanne, she stopped doing grains and the migraines went away. You know, she observed this. She tried it. She heard from someone that that might work. She tried it and it worked for her. For other people, there's neurological issues or rashes and things like that. For some people, it's, it's intestinal discomfort. You know, you're talking like celiac disease. Other people, no issues, you know? So a um, few other thoughts on this. Do you think that sluggard intended for his field to end up like that? No, he just expected it not to. Yeah, we expect the good times to continue indefinitely, and we expect the bad times to pass immediately. And we get upset with God when that doesn't happen. Even when we're reaping what we sow. Yeah, you know, in, in the financial planning world, they, they, they often say that people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. This is a good example, you know? Another thing I think this says very well is the compound effect, right? A little sleep, a little sleep, or a little <laughs> falling of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. And all of a sudden, you're broke, poor, and hungry, you know? All of a sudden, a little bit adds up to a lot over time. Benjamin Franklin, in the, his book, The Way to Wealth, he said that beware the little expenses, for a small leak will sink a great ship. David Bach, he, he wrote an entire book based on the principle, he calls it the latte factor. The people tell him in his classes, I can't afford to put $100 a month for retirement, you know, those 25 year olds. Well, have you ever had a latte? Oh yeah, every day. <laughs> you know, and your smoothie and your bottled water or whatever, these things add up. Buy a water filter, it'll pay for itself in a month and everything else, you know? So, I love this scripture. This is a core scripture for learning, for wisdom, for compounding. So wisdom is all around us. We love wisdom. Wisdom is our friend. If only I'd loved wisdom a lot earlier in my life. So another scripture I'd like to share with you, which I think really captures our cultural tendencies. And it is on the list. And it is Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Who would read that for me? Sure. Bill Bear. Enter through the narrow gate, for the wide gate Wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. The small is the gate, the narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. 
So similar to what we talked about in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, kill, and destroy, what does the wide road look like for America's wealth? Will, you probably know the numbers better than I do. How many Americans, what percent, have less than $1,000 for retirement? 60-something percent. It's a huge 50%, 60%. Um, the vast majority are so ill-prepared. Same with government, by the way, for pensions and stuff, uh, for retirement. But again, we're responsible for our own retirement. It's not our company's response. I mean, they have a plan, some of them, but it's our responsibility to put money into it and to choose investments. It's not their fault that we don't do those things. My company has a 9% company contribution. And I know people that put it in zero. Oh. And so they're missing match. They're leaving money on the table. They're saying no to free money. Money that would be compounding. One gentleman I know has been over 10 years, zero. You know? I don't know, you know? It's not wise, you know? But the, the numbers are horrible. The wide road for Americans for their personal wealth, it's paycheck to paycheck, spending more than they earn, not saving, not putting away for retirement. There's another big number. It's like, I don't, again, maybe 50% of, of, of Americans do not have $400 for an unexpected expense. So if the car broke down or something like that, it's a really big number. And if they increase the number to like 2,000, it's like 75% of the you Americans. Know, because they don't have an emergency fund. Well, I guess I'd use my credit card. The wide road for our health. Somebody mentioned earlier, overweight, obesity. Two thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. And again, I don't think it's they're lazy and they overeat. I think there's a lot going on there. But that's the wide road. Because we're aimless, we're not informed. We're not curious. I wasn't. And the wide road for relationships, divorce, broken families. Jessica and I had a date night not too long ago. In the restaurant was a father-daughter having a father-daughter date. Like this. Um, no. He was looking at his and she was looking at hers. Oh, wow. She finished and tried to talk to him and he, yeah, yeah. Heartbreaking. Especially for someone who longs for children. You know? One book I read not too long ago, it's on the list, it's called The Seven Levels of Intimacy. Very good book for relationships. He describes very well the paradigm that we're in with relationships. We want to be known and we want to be loved for who we really are. But we're so darn afraid to tell you and to show you who we really are because we're afraid you won't like us, that you'll reject us. And so we keep up these shields. We put on this face. Hey, you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Oh, everything's good, yeah, good, good, good. When your heart's breaking, when you don't know what's going on, you can be in a room full of people and you're lonely. That's the wide road with our relationships. I think God wants something better for us. So I did mention my father would buy those new cars because he would refinance his house. He wasn't very good at delaying gratification. And he wasn't alone. I heard someone say once, you cannot achieve anything without delaying gratification. Nothing of, that's been built, nothing that's been achieved happened without delaying gratification. And yet, we are bombarded with the message that you deserve this. Just charge it. You deserve it now. We get impatient with the microwave. <laughs> right? Stupid, what, 60 seconds? <laughs> Shoot. Yeah, we're not good at delaying gratification. Instant gratification is killing us. You know? When it's just so much easier to pull into this take takeout place, fast food here, 
It's probably not, it's not very healthy. But I'm just tired. I didn't have anything ready. I didn't do my food prep Sunday. You know? So I think the greatest example of delayed gratification, can anyone guess it? Heaven. <laughs> we got all these decades of life where we're delayed gratification, right? We're living for something later on, something much better. And the best example of instant gratification, how harmful that can be is sin. Yeah, I want it and I want it now. I'm like that two-year-old, I want it, I want it. And I'm gonna grab it, I'm gonna grab that apple. I have to take care of me. You can't trust God to take care of me. So I'm gonna do that. Instant gratification with our finances, with our spending, with our health, with our food choice, all these things. And they all compound against us. Delayed gratification is for that greater love for yourself. Salute. Yeah. 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 So, um, sorry I can't touch on this more. Yeah. Got a page out of order here. So I should have stapled these together, and now I just got kind of confused. Okay, so some people are gonna have some issues that may go a little deeper than this class. Um, we, we've heard about in motion. They have another class, another session starting up in September, mid-September September. If you have retail therapy issues, <laughs> if you have eating issues, any of those things are deeper. I mean, I would certainly get all you can from all of this content and from the strategies and everything. But if you need a deeper look, a deeper treatment, I would definitely consider emotion. Again, mid-September is when Tim's next class will start. So, do we have the sign-up sheet? Has it gone around? It hasn't, no. it hasn't it hasn't it hasn't Okay, so we didn't do that very well, folks. Have you guys saw sign it? Did you guys all sign it? Yes. You guys? Yeah. Okay, so just the front row. Okay, you guys can stay behind and sign. Did everyone get a handout or the two handouts? Yes. No, you got it. If you did, they're on the table over here. Please, please do me a favor and grab a chair or two and put it on this rack. And that'll help you go home earlier. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.